All right, I think we're good to go. Yep. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to our talk, on Neutron DSCP, Policing Your Network. My name is Nate Johnston. I'm an engineer and developer at Comcast. My name's David Chalkensee. I'm a network software engineer in Intel. Excellent. Um, so let me tell you what we're going to be talking about. Um, uh, first, I'm going to tell you what DSCP is. Uh, I'm going to talk about how you use it. Um, David and I are going to talk about uh, how we implemented DSCP control in uh, Neutron QoS. Uh, we'll cover what some of the next steps are. And uh, in conclusion, we'll show you some of the uh, resources for DSCP in case you want to do more uh, reading about it. First, what is the DSCP? Um, DCP is kind of a mouthful of an acronym. It sounds for Differentiated Services Code Point, which doesn't really tell you much about what it is. Um, but DCP is a protocol for controlling network traffic uh, and categorizing network traffic um, uh, intended to make sure that certain kinds of traffic get precedence over others. Um, uh, and I'll talk more about what that really means in the use cases about DSCP. Uh, but essentially, the, the primary use of DSCP is to make sure that when you have too much traffic and some needs to get dropped, the traffic that you want to get dropped is dropped, and the traffic that's really important isn't dropped. Um, DSCP is standards defined in RFCs, um, primarily RFC 2474. Um, uh, and I have a couple RFCs pointed out here, but later I'll go through uh, or I'll show you that there are a great number of RFCs actually that talk about and define DSCP and how, it, uh, how it's managed. So what is DSCP? Um, DSCP is a six-bit field in the IP header. Um, uh, there's a, a particular field called the diff serve field. Um, uh, it's one byte, so eight bits. The top six bits of that define DSCP. So it's very concise. Um, uh, and it exists both in the IPv4 and IPv6 headers. So this is a representation of the header of an IPv4 packet. The diff serve area you'll see is in red there. Um, you'll note that it's really close to the beginning. Uh, this indicates that uh, DSCP is considered very important because as a router is reading the packet byte by byte, um, uh, the intention is for the most important things to be first because they affect the processing earlier on. So uh, it's really an indication that, I mean, putting it before the length, uh, this is something that was considered by the protocol designers to be extremely important. In IPv6, it's even more important. It's right after the uh, IP version. So um, again, in red here, uh, you can see IPv6. The source and destination IPs occupy much more space, uh, but DSCP is, is still there um, uh, and is still very important. So that byte I was talking about, the, the DS or differentiated services byte, um, uh, are divided into two sections. Um, the top six bits, are uh, they define DSCP. Uh, the bottom two uh, define something else called explicit congestion. Um, uh, notification, which we did not touch as part of our implementation in Neutron QoS. That's something that we'll take a look at as follow-up work. Um, and within those six bits, uh, there's a little bit of uh, categorization. And this is really important if you're going to be uh, really using DSCP in depth or if you're looking at it in a TCP dump. Um, uh, the top three are precedence, um, and then the bottom three define uh, some slightly different behaviors, delay, throughput, and reliability. Not all of those bits are used. Uh, reliability, I don't think, is used in any of the currently defined uh, uh, code points, which are the marks that actually get put into the, those six bits. So let's say you have DSCP defined. Uh, you've got something in that bit. Well, what does that mean? Well, each of those code points, each of those uh, numbers that goes into those six bits uh, uh, corresponds with a per hop behavior. And the per hop behavior uh, is what I was talking about before, you know, defining 
uh, what priority this traffic is in relation to other traffic, so you know whether or not this is going to be dropped, um, or for any other categorization purpose that gets used. Um, and uh, there, are, there are different kinds of per-hop behaviors that have slightly different meanings. Uh, mostly, you can just use them as a list, uh, but there are a few that, are, uh, that have uh, special connotations. Like, for, for example, there's one called EF, expedited forwarding. That's a specific byte code, and that means this is something that really, really has to get through. It's, it's one of almost the top. So in the RFCs, there's some definition that, that some of these codes may, in certain situations, uh, correspond to certain kinds of applications like uh, uh, emergency phone calls or, or things like that. That's, that's something that the RFCs have suggested as a, a use case. So this is a chart of all of the DSCP marks uh, or code points. You see that the class uh, uh, column is, uh, uh, identifies what the, the, the DCP mark is named. Uh, I've color coded it for, uh, for ease. And you can see uh, we've provided some conversion, so hopefully this is a helpful chart. Um, but basically, CS0 means no mark. Just, you know, if you don't use DSCP at all, that's what you get. Um, uh, and they get increasingly more important the further down you go. So something that's CS7 is the last thing that would ever be dropped in a, uh, a bandwidth, uh, uh, bandwidth full situation. Um, So a couple of use cases. How is DCP used in the real world? First off, the sort of what this was designed to do, preferential treatment under congestion. So networks, uh, you know, in a standard case where your links are not saturated, uh, DCP really, it doesn't matter um, because all of the traffic is going to get through. It's only when you have either an artificial or a, uh, an incidental limitation on your bandwidth uh, that the network devices uh, will start examining the DCP packets and making decisions based on them. Um, <clears throat> so uh, by, in your networks, by prioritizing certain traffic, for example, it, let's say you have uh, uh, a voice application and you have need to serve certain kinds of calls that are more important, let's say contacting emergency services. Those might be something that you could uh, prioritize over other kinds of traffic like, say, games or YouTube videos or whatnot, just to make sure they get through. Um, uh, I think that's discussed in the RFCs. Um, uh, or on, in a back office uh, implementation I'm more familiar with uh, to make sure that certain uh, absolutely mandatory streams that have to do with uh, uh, transaction data that can't be dropped uh, always get through, uh, even in cases where, let's say, there's a device outage and you're, you have a, a temporary artificial limitation in your bandwidth because you have, uh, uh, you know, you don't have redundancy in the network path. Um, uh, the other use case, and this is very interesting, this is kind of an off-book uh, use of DSCP that arose. Um, uh, it's not what it was intended for, but it is extremely useful. And that is using DSCP marks as a security policy. So because you've categorized your traffic, um, you can instruct your, uh, your router ACLs or your... Um, uh, or your firewall rules, uh, potentially, to inspect that DSCP byte and make uh, uh, firewall decisions based on that value. Uh, and this is, uh, this is what some of the more interesting uses of DSCP are. Uh, so in, let's say you're using uh, a Neutron that has DSCP enabled, uh, and you uh, configure all of your production VMs to have a certain DSCP mark and all of your development VMs to have a certain DCP mark. Uh, then you, you can collapse your firewall rules down to just look at that DCP mark and say, if you have the production, then, or if you have this DCP mark, then you have access to the production resources. If you have that DCP mark, you have access to the development or QA resources, um, which 
at, in a very large and heterogeneous environment, having that kind of ability to simplify your firewall rules uh, really makes things easy, and uh, especially when you have the elasticity that you can have in an OpenStack environment, uh, it means that you can potentially define things on the fly instead of having them be defined in advance um, uh, through uh, CIDR-based uh, network uh, firewall categorization. Um, so uh, I have here the, uh, the example for um, what uh, Cisco syntax would be. Um, there, there's similar syntax in Juniper and Nokia firewalls um, and uh, most other uh, hardware-based uh, traditional network uh, firewall or processing type devices. Okay, so implementing DSCP in QoS. How did we, how did we do it? Um, how does it work? First off, um, we, had, uh, we tried to get this in for our Mataka. Um, we didn't quite make it, but it is in already merged for Newton. So when Newton is delivered, you'll have the, this uh, capability ready to go. So um, in the Liberty release, uh, was the first implementation of QoS, generally speaking, and that was bandwidth limiting. Um, uh, the DSCP implementation extends the QoS implementation um, uh, to uh, include DSCP marking as an additional um, uh, item that can be part of your QoS configuration. You can have bandwidth limiting, you can have DSCP, or you could have both. It's, it's not a one or the other kind of situation. Um, attaching a QoS policy to a port uh, is uh, exactly as it uh, has been uh, in Liberty with bandwidth limiting. Um, you create a QoS policy and you can put in a description for that policy. Um, but instead of uh, in what you do in Liberty where you add a bandwidth limiting rule, you can do a clause DSCP marking rule create um, uh, with the given DSCP mark. Um, and then uh, once, you've, once you've added that, uh, you can assign the uh, QoS policy to a port. Um, so except for the, the middle line, this is all identical, identical to what you have in Liberty and Mataka. Uh, it's just the, the additional DSCP capability. Here we have um, uh, kind of a uh, showing exactly what the interchange is between uh, the neutron server and the neutron agent. <coughs> so to, uh, to implement this, um, uh, the reference implementation is OVS-based. Um, uh, uh, so we're using uh, the uh, OVS uh, ML2 plugin um, and uh, OVS mechanism driver. And as part of the previous QoS work, um, there was a, uh, the uh, uh, L2 agent extension. So you can have an extension loaded into your L2 agent uh, to facilitate control on the compute node. Um, so uh, there is DCP specific code on uh, both on the controller and the agent that gets loaded. Um, so let's say you want to assign a particular DCP mark to a particular port. Um, uh, this, uh, so, um, you uh, initiate a transaction to update the port. Um, uh, the compute, uh, well, you, you can see what the, the policy says, or what the, the slide says. Um, the QoS policy uh, gets inspected. Um, uh, the compute fetches the rules, um, uh, and then um, the compute uh, indicates that the subscription to the policy has been accomplished and the controller notifies the compute uh, when the policy changes. So here's a little bit more about the QoS extension architecture um, that I talked about before. Um, uh, so in the, in the controller and the Neutron process, you have the core API and then the QoS API extension, which talks to the ML2 plugin and OVS mechanism driver. <coughs> um, 
uh, and the OVS driver uh, communicates over RPC to the, um, uh, to the QoS uh, agent extension in the L2 agent, um, uh, which then notifies the OVS agent um, using the uh, OVS uh, OFCTL um, uh, command line. Uh, it, as with uh, all the other actions that control open vSwitch flows, um, it uses that interface to OVS to control um, the, the configuration. Oh, after this. Okay. <laughs> All right. So here's a uh, provider network uh, with OVS. Um, this looks uh, similar, I'm sure, to many neutron diagrams that you've seen. Um, but uh, specifically, we're, you can see indicated here in the integration bridge, you can see exactly where the DCP markings are applied. And this makes sure that um, all of the, uh, the traffic uh, coming out of the instance um, gets marked. So, for example, let's say your instance, uh, you, you have a tenant that, uh, you know, doesn't know what they're doing or they're doing something wrong and they say, all right, I'm going to decide to mark my DSCP traffic this way. Well, that doesn't matter because all their traffic, when it comes out, the OVS integration bridge uh, has the, the OVS flows um, that, uh, that mandate the DSCP and uh, uh, they, they will erase what the current marking is and apply the marking that's been defined in Neutron. Uh, and then that traffic goes out the BREX uh, and out. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to run through quickly a little bit about the OpenFlow <coughs> switch. So uh, the OpenFlow switch has a number of tables that you can define flow entries onto. And uh, flow entry consists of a matching case, uh, counters, and an action list. So the matching case is the criteria you want it to match on. Uh, counters keep track of the number of packets that go through it, the number of bytes that go through it, uh, the time it's been uh, created, and the idle time. Uh, and then the action list defines uh, one or multiple actions. So you can choose to drop the packet, you can uh, send it on normally, or in this case, you can modify the ter uh, type of service field or diff serve field uh, to change the DSCP value. So uh, just here, when we first made the first implementation, we didn't want to disrupt the default neutron table uh, that much, so we wanted to try and keep as much the same as possible. Uh, so what we did was we made a low-priority flow uh, just before the default normal action at priority zero. Uh, so we set it to priority one. It would match on the port it was coming in from, so in this case, in port six. And uh, it would modify the uh, type of service uh, field. Uh, in this case, it's put down as 104. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, when you are writing to this field, uh, you have to bit shift it by four to the, or by two to the left, sorry, which has the effect of multiplying it by four. Uh, so the original value there was 26, and uh, it has to be bit shifted so that it doesn't overwrite the ENC field. So now it's 104. So after it's been added, uh, you can see in the TCP dump output that uh, it's marked the type of service field. Uh, it's put down there as hex for 0x68, 68, sorry. Um, so that shows that the rule did apply. Um, when you're checking to make sure that you've applied the DCP value, uh, it's important to check that the last uh, value is either 0, 4, 8, or C. So that means that you haven't overwritten the ECN bit. Uh, also, something to take or to be aware of is that the, low, the lowest bit uh, isn't normally set. So really the only valid values are zero and eight. So if it's four or C, then it means you've set the lowest bit, uh, which isn't a valid DSCP mark, um, of which there are 21 valid DSCP marks as shown before. So as we can see in Wireshark then, uh, it shows uh, the exact same. You have uh, the mark 0x68. 
and uh, it actually shows you the classification as well. So it has the assured forwarding uh, class, assured forwarding of class three, and it has a priority, a drop priority of one. So uh, there were some challenges uh, when we were doing this, one of which was that the L2 agent uh, had, um, uh, it appended a cookie value onto flows that uh, was, that matched a, um, sorry, that matched a UUID that was in the OVS Neutron agent. Uh, so this UUID was unique to the session ID for Neutron and it was used to uh, clean up any stale flows that were in the flow table from maybe an unexpected restart. So it would stop disruption. Uh, the problem with this was, was that uh, extensions couldn't get access to it. So it, wasn't, it was unique and extensions couldn't put it on. So what would happen was every time a port was updated or uh, a firewall was updated or it restarted, uh, it would delete all the flows that didn't have a cookie ID that matched the uh, session ID. So the solution we had for this in a very kind of short way to describe it was that we created a API that would go into the L2 extensions that assigned them their own unique cookie ID. So this helped, uh, first of all, extensions to have their own ID, which is very helpful, uh, especially when you're trying to modify flows and delete flows after you've created them from any, for any reason that you might want to. Uh, and this helped preserve the, uh, the flows whenever a uh, port was updated, the firewall was updated, and more importantly, it didn't delete them, uh, or they would be successfully recreated if the agent restarted. So uh, just a bit more kind of detail on the L2 extensions API. Um, it's initialized in the OVS Neutron agent. It gets passed into the L2 extensions manager uh, and a consume API method was added to the class that all L2 extensions are derived from. Uh, this wasn't an abstract class. This was a class that accepted an object and just did nothing. So this way we wouldn't actually break any other uh, extensions that use this uh, when we implemented this. So um, well, the change specifically that we made to do this was that just before uh, an extension was initialized, its consume API method was called and the API was passed in. So uh, because if it wasn't implemented before this, uh, the method wouldn't have been overridden. Uh, it just meant that it dropped the API object as opposed to using it. Um, so just more specifically on what it does. So uh, as you can see here, the pro, uh, uh, when the API is consumed, the extension can choose to either consume it, can, well, consume it, uh, where they could either take the integration and tunnel bridges that have been passed into it. So these are the same bridges that are shared by the OVS Neutron agent. So they have their own session IDs in there and everything. But uh, another thing we did as well was created a, a new uh, mixin called the Cookie Bridge mixin. And what this did was it generated more unique IDs whenever it, they were requested and it added them to a list of approved IDs, which would not be deleted when a port was updated, firewall was updated, or the agent restarted. Uh, and these are usually initialized in the, uh, the initialize of the extensions. So just uh, something it also does is when you request to get these agents off of the L2 uh, extensions API, is that it wraps it in a class called the OVS cookie bridge. So for all intents and purposes, this OVS cookie bridge is a pass-through class where uh, everything you do just basically goes straight to the integration or tunnel bridge that you've requested. Um, so what this means is just that you have all the access of the integration and tunnel bridges from the extensions. 
Uh, what it does do, though, is it doesn't directly pass through on the uh, add flow, delete flow, modify flow, or dump flow methods. So what it does there is if no cookie is specified, it will append the unique cookie ID of that extension to the flow. So in this way, if you aren't aware that you need a, cookie, a unique cookie to do this, it'll do it for you. But if there is a specific cookie you want to specify, it won't overwrite that for you. So if you want to have a look at what other flows are, exist from other extensions, you can do that by specifying criteria for all cookies to be looked at. Um, yes. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so just another problem then that came up was feature isolation. So now that we've let all the extensions use the flow table, there's another problem that's kind of come up where extensions <coughs> won't be aware of what other extensions might want to do. So when you're developing for an extension, you might not anticipate another extension using the flow table. So when you're developing, you'll obviously see the OVS uh, neutron agents flows, and those are probably the only things you'll consider. But if, let's say, networking SFC is on at the same time and they're forwarding the packets to other places, then uh, they won't necessarily reach the DSCP marking rule because if you remember previously, uh, that rule or the uh, priority of the flow we created was priority one. So it's the lowest priority to try and least affect the rest of the flow table and then normally forwards it. So most extensions that use the flow table will probably forward the traffic as soon as they're finished with it. And that causes a problem because if we're later on and we're not going to get the flow anymore, we're not going to get the packet anymore, it means the DSCP marking rule won't work when in combination with other extensions. So we tried to preemptively address this. Uh, so we, what we did was we used the resubmit method. And so what we decided to do was there is five optional registries in the on flows. So, and it's metadata that kind of sticks onto the packet but isn't sent with the packet. So when it comes in and it reaches our flow, what we decided to do was we'd mark one of these registers and we'd also make that this register being clear was a criteria for going into it. So what, that, what the effect of that is, is that when it hits our flow, uh, it will modify the type of service field, but it'll also write a value into the register. And then when that's modified, we then, rather than sending it on normally, we resubmit it to the default table, table zero. So that comes back in. And then when it hits our flow again, it doesn't match the criteria for it anymore, and it'll continue to, through table zero uh, to the next flow that it'll meet. If there's no other flows, it'll just hit the default normal action at priority zero. If there is, those other features will be able to work with it. Now, the other problem is what happens if there's a higher priority <coughs> flow. So other extensions might not have given the same consideration for this. So they could send it on, and it'll never get to us and that's a problem if you're trying to use DSCP. So how we addressed this was we <coughs> simply made it the highest priority on the table. Uh, so it will always hit our flow first, and then it'll resubmit it, and it'll go back into the table, and any other feature that wants to use it then has access to it. So if you just see here what we have, just uh, the actual uh, Suppose this is kind of for, this isn't the exact flow dump of what we have at the moment, <coughs> uh, but this is a future plan. So there's plans at the moment to try and work with flow management a bit more with all the extensions. So it's something we're planning on addressing at the summit. <coughs> uh, so one of the many things we could do is define certain tables for certain extensions and uh, ask that from these tables, they get forwarded back to table zero and 
uh, then all the other extensions can kind of get through it as well. Uh, so just as you can see here, uh, you have register two equal to zero x zero, and that means if it's not marked by default, it'll forward it onto table 10, and then at table 10, it loads the value, <coughs> sorry, loads the value zero x 37 into the register between the zero and five bit mark, and then it marks the type of service value, diff serve, and uh, it resubmits it to table zero. Uh, and through this way, it goes back to table zero, processes it, and whatever else needs it can use it then. So another problem is, because this is another iteration to the QoS rules and policies, it's a new rule that's just been added. Uh, it raises the question of what happens if there is a agent that is of an older type than what supports QoS. So when we added QoS, the QoS rule type, uh, QoS rule type version incremented to 1.1. What happens if its uh, version is only 1.0? So the agent needs to know the instance ID and it needs to know how to address this. So one of these is the, uh, well, version object, uh, but the, server, the um, or PC callbacks upgrades. So as you can see here, it consists mainly of three parts, uh, the Neutron OVS agent, the RabbitMQ advanced message queue, and the Neutron server. Uh, so what you kind of have first happening is that uh, the Neutron OVS agent <coughs> reports the version type of the QoS rule type. So in this case, it's version 1.1, reports it to the RP, RBC namespace resources, Q, and that goes to the Neutron server. Uh, the Neutron server creates a fanout queue uh, uh, of QoS rule type one, and that can connect to the QoS rule type one objects. That fans out, so all the <coughs> versions of that same type connect through that queue. So what happens now when a version 1.1 comes along? So almost identically the same thing reports its version through the namespace resources queue. It creates the QoS rule type 1.1 fan out, and it fans out and all the versions of 1.1 are connected to the queue. So I'm just going to hand back to my co-host. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, so um, uh, the reference implementation was the beginning, but it doesn't cover everything. Um, a few things that uh, we didn't look at, um, but uh, are on the roadmap for things we'd like to do in the future. Um, first is ingress DSCP filtering. Um, uh, this is something I think uh, uh, can be a part of the Far as a Service project uh, in the future as they <coughs> move forward with their uh, version two spec. Um, so the idea is uh, implementing uh, filtering at the uh, 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 at the tenant level, so that you can say uh, uh, only allow in traffic with a certain DSCP mark. Uh, essentially, replicating the kind of filtering capability that you have in your network devices um, within uh, OpenStack filtering. I'm not going to do this in traditional security groups because we need to. Uh, Neutron security groups are uh, you know very specific. They they have certain compatibility requirements, but this is a great item uh, for a uh, possible future roadmap for far as a service. Um, and then second, uh, marking encapsulating packets uh, with the DCP mark of the traffic inside. So if you have a VXLAN uh, tunnel, for example, um, you can, uh, and the traffic inside the tunnel has a certain DCP mark, you can also mark the VXLAN encapsulation frame with that same DCP mark. Uh, we didn't include this because uh, we figured there probably aren't going to be many uh, uh, situations where you have a, uh, uh, a bandwidth limiting situation within a cluster because typically the, the kinds of networking you have within a, a, an OpenStack deployment are, um, you have typically a lot of bandwidth. Uh, so this, this is kind of a lower priority item, but it is something that uh, we want to look at in the future because it seems like a natural next step to go. Um, 
So here we have, uh, I have some links here. Um, uh, if you get the slides uh, for uh, some of the, the additional future roadmap items that we have, um, we wanna look at uh, neutron support for the explicit uh, congestion notification bits, um, which are uh, wholly separate in how they operate and what they do from the DCP part, even though they occupy the same byte in the IP header. <coughs> uh, there's also uh, some work towards uh, uh, more generalized neutron traffic classification uh, work. Um, uh, in addition to the existing quality of service uh, bandwidth limiting, uh, we're also uh, on the roadmap for QoS's uh, min, uh, minimum bandwidth guarantees, um, which involves uh, some integration with the Nova scheduler to say, uh, you know, this, this VM will always, under all situations, have at least this much bandwidth. Um, and uh, finally, uh, ingress bandwidth limiting. Um, so to perform the same uh, bandwidth limiting, we have the current implementation from implementation for bandwidth limiting is egress bandwidth limiting, but to provide the same implementation for ingress bandwidth. All right, concluding. So how do you use it? Um, uh, in the Neutron server, in Neutron.conf, uh, you engage the, uh, the QoS plugin as one of the service plugins. Um, in the, uh, the ML2 plugin and the L2 agent, um, uh, you note the, uh, the extension uh, for QoS is to be loaded. Uh, since DSCP is just part of the broader QoS extension, um, uh, this is uh, pretty much the same as uh, for Mataka and Liberty. Uh, in DevStack, again, you enable QoS. Uh, there's an enable service, Q-QoS, that's available for that. And uh, uh, here are the directives to engage this, essentially the same configuration directives that I showed you before, but in a dev stack environment. Uh, other open stack resources. Uh, there's a lot out there about, op about or, sorry, other, uh, yes, uh, other QS related resources uh, that are helpful if you're interested in this. Um, there's a lot. About, uh, about DSCP and QoS in general. Um, there was a great presentation in Tokyo about the initial QoS effort. Um, uh, we have documentation already in the networking guide. Um, uh, we have uh, some work to, uh, that's uh, in progress right now to implement the DSCP controls for heat templates. Um, uh, and we've linked to all of the uh, all of the changes that have already merged or are currently in progress here. So if you're, uh, if you're really interested, not just in the DCP work, but also the L2 agent extension uh, work that was merged in Mataka and the RPC rolling upgrades, which we described earlier, um, that was merged for Mataka, um, you can uh, take a look at those uh, through these links. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, DCP is uh, uh, defined by the RFCs. You can see there are a lot of RFCs, RFCs that, uh, that talk about DSCP or differentiated services, which is the general category that DSCP falls into. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, these are the canonical reference um, uh, and they define every aspect of how DSCP is implemented and handled, not just with, you know, this is, this is what we're trying to, to, um, to use as our standard uh, but this is also will tell you how network devices will uh, inspect and handle uh, traffic that is DSCP marked. Um, there are also, I mean, there are patents uh, that uh, are related to how DSCP can be used um, and uh, uh, what, uh, what ways uh, can uh, DSCP be implemented for, uh, uh, for various business cases. And finally, just want to say thank you to a number of people in the community. Um, Margaret Francis with Comcast uh, helped hugely in the effort. Uh, uh, Miguel Angel Ajo, uh, Ihar, uh, Victor Howard, uh, James Reeves, Gary Cotton, and John Schwartz. Uh, not an exhaustive list, but uh, this was a, a really big change uh, to get merged in. And we just want to say thank you to everybody who helped out with that. Um, legal mumbo jumbo. Thank you. And I think we have time for one question. We have one minute left. Sir? Does this only work with ML2? 
it doesn't work with the monolithic neutron, or can it be used with that? It, it is only implemented in uh, ML2 for OVS at this point. Um, uh, future implementation, implementations like uh, Linux Bridge or other things like that are definitely something that we want to look at, but uh, just, to, just to get it out the door and get the concept solid, uh, that's the way we went for the first implementation. All right, thank you very much.